And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. I'm Hamdi Kavak, an assistant professor at George Mason University's Computational and Data Sciences Department. This study was conducted at the Virginia Modeling Analysis and Simulation Center, or, or, or VMASC, at Old Dominion University while I was a graduate student there. So my co-authors are my advisor, Jose Padilla, uh, Saiko Diallo, and Anthony Baracco from VMASC. So in this study, we explored the learning progress of a modeler from an empirical perspective. So when I say modeler, I mean a person who is learning to develop a simulation model like a student. Okay. So what do we mean by learning? Learning is simply a progress, but it can be formulated in terms of different forms. For instance, sometimes it is associated with uh, experience uh, versus learning. Sometimes learning is considered proficiency on something that changes over time. Or sometimes it is considered performance that has the potential to change based on the number of attempts. So here's a typical learning curve. Sorry for my bad hand drawing. It, uh, I was trying to improve my hand drawing skills lately. All right. Anyways, so in a typical uh, learning curve, uh, we compare learning progress with experience. And assuming this curve presents the learning progress of a learner with no prior background on the topic, we have a slow start, uh, which is the orange line here. It takes great experience to, for a person to get some initial learning progress. Then we, we have the green line, which indicates the steep progress. Then later, uh, for advanced type of uh, learning experience, we have this red line, which means a rough learning progress and sometimes called plateau. And the challenge is that we don't know if uh, this learning curve is good to understand the modeler's learning progress. Also, it is challenging to measure the learner's state on the y-axis. So we don't know where are we, where, where is our student on that uh, learning axis. Of course, uh, there are ways to measure that. So uh, there are two main uh, approaches to measure the learning progress. Uh, first one is called the sum summative assessments, like tests, quizzes, and other graded activities such as assignments. So these summative assessments uh, techniques yield a grade, which can indicate the learning progress. The other one is the uh, formative assessment, where an instructor gives input and provides feedback to the learner. The idea is that the, uh, with the formative assessment, the learner gets that input and feedback to improve the learning. Although it's a bit subjective, uh, we can still associate the uh, informal feedback with some sort of learning progress. Well, uh, these techniques, so what is wrong with these? Well, these techniques are so old that they even predate the invention of computers as we know of today. So what is wrong with that apart from being uh, very old? That uh, they are not designed for measuring the progress of a modeler's learning. We didn't have computer models at that time. Well, uh, also, Another problem is that these uh, techniques are very labor intensive. They require the learner, instructor, or both to actively participate in, and also assessment needs to be repeated. So the point is, we can do better at assessing modelers learning progress, and we don't need to rely on classical assessment techniques, and we don't even need an active participation of the modeler or instructor, we can passively collect data and measure learning progress of the modeler empirically and develop a model of the modeler. But how? So that's a big question. Well, it's actually quite simple, but the modeling and simulation field is not necessarily ready for this at this point. We need to start with the simulation development tools that we use today. We need to create or leverage tools that allow us uh, to easily collect meaningful but passive model development data. When I say passive, I mean no active user participation is needed. So the user won't experience the difference between data collection mode and the regular operation mode. But unfortunately, many tools, especially those open source ones used by academia today, are not ready for this purpose. But still, there are some, especially uh, some web-based simulation environments like clouds are perfect fit for this. And what is clouds.me? 
So clouds.me is world's very first web-based discrete event simulation development environment created at VMask. And you just navigate to clouds.me on your browser and log into the system. By the way, uh, I'm very fortunate to be one of the early developers and team members for this tool. And in terms of other features, it's cloud deployed, so it's scalable, mo mobile accessible, and code free. You don't need to develop any code, but use the interface only. And there are users from more than 70 countries that use clouds. And there are many unique features uh, that clouds offers, as you see on the screen. And all these features are actually also free. So this is the uh, Clouds user interface. So there are three main tabs, uh, conceptual design, simulation builder, and tools, and many buttons above to save the model, run the model, and other settings. When you expand the simulation builder tab, it opens up this enlarged panel you see on the right, and all buttons you see there can be dragged and dropped into the model development environment. So here you see a simple uh, bank queuing model on clouds. So the one on the left you see is a conceptual representation. And the one on the right you see is the clouds equivalent of that concept. So there are other useful features of clouds, such as importing one of your existing models running replications, adding integrated plots, and data collection to be used for like inter-arrival or process time speeding. So, so what did we do with clouds? With user content, we captured many user actions from clouds. You see a list of actions here. Uh, actions that are bold here, uh, have an asterisk and bold are actually a lot more detailed. For instance, the action of adding a block actually holds additional information on like which block is added. Similarly, delete block has like which block is deleted and so on. And others have similar additional features too. So by collecting these action data from user, what did we do? We constructed a data set and in this data set, we recorded around 102,000 events in approximately in a year. And this was back in 2015-ish, so uh, it was in the early years of the clouds. And after cleaning and filtering the data, we approximately had 70,000 user actions from 296 users. And in total, we had uh, approximately 1,100 models developed. You see the user breakdown based on the expertise level and area on the left and middle. Also, the, uh, the simulation per user distribution is on the right. So we fit this uh, simulation per user data to, a, to the power law distribution and gathered the dashed line uh, fit, which has the exponent 294 with the, the lower cutoff value of six. So this distribution uh, somehow resembles the user behavior seen in, seen in other technological platforms. A lot of users develop very limited number of models, but some users develop a lot. So using this data, we developed a user behavior console. And this is a, a screenshot from that user behavior console. And it's a good summary for a simulation data. So you see that uh, general, there are general stats, uh, block stats, and action stats. And you see how much time the user spent on the simulation. What are the things that the user did, like building, running? And you can also see the user expertise and industry. And other things like block stats, how many added blocks of each type, and actions as well. And you see here another screen from the user behavior console. This is a summary of sequences of actions in a simulation. Here, each symbol represents a particular action. So uh, on the left upper, you see A as the arrival, E as the entity. And it's, for instance, when you see a dash there, that means the two blocks are, uh, are connected with an edge. And you see the whole uh, development sequence on, on the, in the bottom. So our goal is to measure the learning progress, but we are not there yet to measure the learning progression. But nonetheless, we did some experiments to understand the differences between different groups of users. So 
we ran one-way analysis of variance tests to see the difference between simulations developed by beginners versus simulations developed by uh, intermediate users. We also uh, compared simulations developed by advanced users versus expert users. So we found four factors with statistically significant difference for beginners versus intermediates. intermediates. So the number of build errors and the percentage of build error are significantly higher for beginner users. And the percentage of block addition and the percentage of edge addition are significantly higher too. So this particular result suggests that a simulation learner adds fewer blocks to the model while be, uh, becoming more proficient. So this result is uh, somehow in, in intuitive as this fact can be seen associated with other situations like beginner programmers tend to write longer codes even for relatively easy tasks. We want to emphasize that whether a user is beginner or intermediate are self-declared by user when they register. We also found six factors between advanced and expert users, but these results are the artifact of having very limited number of actions by expert users. So expert users not into the tool in terms of uh, developing simulations. So uh, what can be done with, uh, with such data uh, in addition to the uh, ANOVA test that I showed? So uh, we ad identified four potential uses of such user action data. So it's a fact that people have unique writing, writing styles and also code development styles that can be identified with enough training data. So uh, the question is, can we have something similar for uh, simulation devel model development? Maybe uh, sequence mining algorithms can help us to identify that. As the second point, uh, the main topic that we are interested in actually, we can potentially measure the learning progress. So we can train a supervised classifier based on self-reported expertise and use this classifier to understand the expertise of a user who is just registered on the system, regardless of their initial claim. So we can use this data to improve user engagement and gamification. Uh, so for instance, we can mine patterns of successful model development, meaning it runs without error, and suggest other users to improve their model. And in terms of gamification, uh, we can enable collecting badges when the user does certain things like running the model with replications or using like more advanced blocks like separate and batch. And finally, we can use the data to improve the tool itself, especially in terms of uh, user interface improvements. All right, this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening.